Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to, to Brazil and to Rio. I've never been before, so this is a, a unique experience for me. Uh, I hope I'm not going to give you a lecture today, but really to share uh, our experiences that we've had in England about some of the changes that we've uh, introduced into the NHS in England. First of all, a little about me. Uh, first important thing to know is I'm not a doctor. Uh, never have been and never will be a doctor. I'm a civil servant. I work for the government. Uh, I devise and invent uh, these policies that the government have, and every time we change the government, I change the policy. So um, much of the, the problems in the NHS in England on primary care is probably my fault because I've been a, around doing this now for 16 years on primary care in England. The other important thing to know about me is I'm a diabetic, and I have an 11-year-old daughter uh, who's missing me, and I have to um, uh, speak to her on Skype every day so that uh, I have to reassure her that um, everything's wonderful in Rio. A little also about the reforms in the NHS. Uh, I came into my post in 2004. Um, the changes around the GP contractual arrangements in England came in in 2003 and it took us until about 2006 to understand and realize uh, the law of unintended consequences so that every time you make an action you get uh, an opposite reaction and so we started to try and make some adjustments to our contractual arrangements with GPs to improve the quality and to continue to improve and drive um, quality of services and access and services. So I'd like to um, start by talking a little bit about the NHS in England. Um, what I intend to cover is very much about the overview of primary care in England, uh, the key features, the key characteristics of the, of the general practice, which has been in place since 1948, largely unchanged, um, but also about how it looks today in a modern um, setting. Um, something about the funding arrangements, about the challenges that face primary care in England, uh, and then about what we're doing to try and improve quality, what's good for patients, what good access looks like, but also why we need to do more to improve access. Uh, and then finally to talk a little bit about the quality and how we are using competition in the NHS in England uh, and empowering patients to try and also make improvements. Um, a little bit for you in context, um, England is a very small island compared to Brazil. Uh, our population is about one quarter of your population and we're about one thirtieth of your size. Um, if that was in scale, um, then it wouldn't be so bad, but uh, the reality is um, we're much smaller than that um, and you're much bigger than that map. So um, we have some issues when you think about the geography and when I talk about improving access, it's completely different from improving access in Brazil and I appreciate that. That should give you some idea of the differences in size between us. Going too fast. Um, first of all, to say that uh, the NHS in England is free at the point of care for patients for most treatments. Um, the model of care, the primary care that we have in England, is based around the JEP practice being responsible for a, a list of registered patients, patients who choose to go to that GP practice and for that practice to be responsible for their care and the coordination of their care um, for the rest of their life as long as they remain there. But if they move on to another GP practice for that health record to move with them so that we have a lifelong record from cradle to grave about the health needs of that patient and how different practitioners have treated those patients. The GP practice is responsible therefore not only for providing care for the patients, but also in trying to manage and coordinate care uh, into specialist services, into hospital services for those patients as well. And when they come out of those specialist centers to manage their care again back in the, uh, in the community in which they live. In England, the GP practice is the first port of call for treatment and usually the last port of call for treatment as well. Um, what that means is about 9 out of 10 patient contacts in the NHS for healthcare services occurs in general practice. 
So they actually only refer into hospital or to some other specialist service about one in 10 patients. Um, and that really gives the GP role not just as a gatekeeper trying to stop people going into hospital, but actually to try and get people into hospital at the right time to offer the right care by the right person um, at the right place. And their job is to try and coordinate those things, not to take the responsibility themselves to deliver all of that, but to try and work with others in the community uh, and in hospital settings to ensure that care is delivered. But it's also not just about their role as a healthcare provider. They have an important public health role in how they um, both screen their populations for diseases, for treating those patients and giving them vaccinations and uh, childhood immunization, and for looking after the childhood development of children as they come through from birth and through to the late um, uh, period before they go off to school. In what GPs do, therefore, they're a really important part of our NHS in England. And much of the reforms you might hear about that's going on in England at present is around trying to cement that role of the GP practice uh, at the heart of making decisions about not just the care they provide, but about the care that is provided in hospitals as well. Um, because it's not just about the choices the GP makes in how they treat a patient how they prescribe to that patient or how they um, refer that patient into hospital. It's as much about what they don't do that they could have done. Um, that if they had managed that care earlier, then the person wouldn't have had care break down and have to go into hospital. To ensure that actually they can manage those long-term conditions at an early intervention so that the uh, onset of the disease or the problem is delayed rather than occurring as a breakdown very early on. And so it's important that what we try to talk about is much about what general practice can do better as well as what they're doing well now in England. The majority of our GPs in England are, um, are self-employed. They own the business, they run the business, uh, they contract with the NHS as independent contractors who we buy the services from. Um, there's around about 3% of our general practice, however, that's run by commercial organizations. Um, that's not the GP practice running them, but a company that runs them. And that's a fairly new development um, that's only taking place since 2006. And that was really to introduce new models of delivery of care and to introduce some competition into the system. Um, because otherwise there was some collusion going on between the GPs about how they treated uh, patients and how they didn't compete with each other. But as you can see, 97% of our healthcare is still provided by that general practitioner uh, as an independent businessman who delivers the services. And we contract with them for those arrangements uh, and where necessary, we bring in new providers. We've got about 8,300 practices uh, in England. Um, it's actually reducing in the number uh, year on year. And that's not because we've got fewer GPs year on year. Uh, that's because they choose to come together and get bigger practices and for them to work uh, much more closely together. So what we're starting to see is much more that the practices are getting uh, bigger with more GPs in them looking after more patients, but overall the number of patients they're caring for by their general practitioner, the individual, is shrinking. So the average practice is four GPs. It looks after about 6,600 patients. And that means around about 1,600 patients for each GP. Put that in context, in 2003, the average list size per GP was 18,000 patients, uh, and we had about 50% of our practices were single-handed GPs. So they're coming together and they're doing that by their own choice because it's the care and the services that they can provide together. What we provide is an overall investment into the practice. Um, that income generates not only the um, expenses for employing staff, for employing nurses, for employing receptionists and other people, and the premises costs, but it is also their profit, it is also their pay. And so therefore, the more efficient they get, the more pay they can take as well in those arrangements. But fundamentally, what we're trying to do is get a balance into them that expands their capacity, that they are willing to take on more patients, that they're willing to expand their business and to deliver more care. 
Other important thing to say that um, in England, one of the changes we brought about, we changed the model of care from the GP being responsible for 24 hours, seven days a week for the patient to where they're actually only now responsible for those patients um, during the day, Monday to Friday, from eight o'clock in the morning till six o'clock in the evening. Um, so, and at weekends and later in the evening, uh, we have a different separate arrangement for urgent care for when people need it. Uh, a little bit about funding. We spend, I spend about 8.4 billion pounds, um, which is a lot of money with GPs. That's the amount total of investment that we make in for them, for their expenses, for their costs, and also for their profit. But that only works out, um, in our terms, about 158 pound per head of population for primary care services. To give you a context, what we spend per patient uh, in the rest of the services we offer in the H NHS is around about £2,000 per patient. So primary care is a good investment to make in more investment in because actually it's not only cheaper, but you can offer, deliver better quality care in the community to those people. The way their funding is quite complex, and I've tried to make it simpler in here, but uh, I can go into more detail if anyone's uh, silly enough to ask me to. Um, it's basically a, what we call a weighted capitation model that provides the majority of their funding. So every time a patient registers without practice, there's a sum of money adjusted for age, for sex, for also the need of those patients that is given to the practice. And that makes up somewhere around between 50 and 60% of income to that practice that guarantees that level of funding to that practice to look after that population. On top of that, they have a quality reward scheme. I'm going to talk more about that tomorrow and on pay for performance, but it's important to know that makes up around about 14 to 15% of the total investment that goes to practices. And that's for doing things around the quality of care that they offer to their patients, around implementing evidence-based disease management uh, arrangements to ensure that patients get the best care uh, and their rewarded practices are rewarded for doing those things. In addition to those things, um, there's additional services which are bought from the GP practice. Uh, some of them are common from all GP practices around vaccinating children, around flu, around doing things to ensure that they offer longer opening times um, convenient to their patients. Some of them also are about specific to the skills of that practice or to the needs of that practice. And those services are bought locally um, by the NHS from them. And that makes about another 10% of a practice income. And then finally, we have direct reimbursement to the practices for things like premises and IT expenses and those costs, which we call pass-through costs, which are what they incur, and they're just passed on to us and we fund them. Finally, for a small number of practices in our rural areas, and I'm conscious in Brazil talking about rural areas compared to England is a little strange, um, but we have some, um, some more remote communities uh, and where they don't have a local pharmacy, it's the GP practice that actually offers um, not only writing the prescription, but also dispenses the medicines to them. And that co that's about another 9% of total funding to practices. Some challenges that we face um, in England and I suspect in most parts of the world and the population is getting older, although we had a recent um, census of our population every 10 years, and it turns out we've got more people than we knew about, and uh, they're actually a bit younger than we thought they were. But nevertheless, um, the pressures on our population is one of a growing elderly population with more diseases linked together, and pay general practice is trying to manage those care morbidities. And, and as a consequence, we need to encourage them to, to focus on earlier intervention, earlier diagnosis of those diseases, and then helping the patients to empower those patients to, to maintain some of their own health conditions and not for it to always fall back onto the NHS or to fall back onto those doctors to provide those cares as well. So, so we're trying to empower the patients to, uh, through self-care arrangements as well. 
we also need to get joined up care, better joined up care between um, what happens between GPs in primary care and the hospital sector, and what we call vertical integration, but also horizontal integration between what happens in the community with social care and social services, and how the local authority can help on housing and education to make changes as well. So we need to have vertical integration as well as a horizontal integration. Lots of people talk in England and talk around the world of the, the different ways of doing it and the, um, to, you have a, a single uh, um, um, body that's responsible for everything. Uh, our personal view is it's not about structures, it's about people, it's about leadership. And, and where people want to make it work, they can make it work, whatever the structure. And however integrated your organisation is, if you do not have that leadership, it really does not matter. They will not share, they will not um, work together. Other challenges we face around our GP workforce, although we're growing it year on year, is actually more of those GPs want to work part-time. They don't want to see patients every day um, and see them um, eight hours a day. They want to have other things in their life, usually to do with the healthcare and doing other things, but often also to see their own family. So we're seeing much more part-time working and we're seeing a younger generation of GPs that do not want to take on running a business, buying into that business and that partnership, but actually just want to be salaried by their doctors and, by, and to be employed by them. Uh, they give slightly less commitment to that practice as a consequence, and so we, we see some changes and some challenges in there. What we've also got is some unexplained variations between what the very best practices offer and the not so good practices offer and they are often to do with the way the care is provided. It's not about the qualifications or the clinicians themselves, but about some other things about what motivates them, their interests, and about the structures and how they work with those things around them. So we're trying to very much tackle as well those variations between practices. And then final thing that um, we certainly are facing in this economic cl climate is that the money that we've ha invested over the years is getting a lot less. Um, we've invested in the NHS between 2002 and 2010 that the, the resources in the NHS grew by over 50%, near 60%. Um, so in 2004, the contract that well, we paid GPs was around about um, 4 billion, and now it's around 8.6 billion. So as you can see, we've made a big investment. Looking forwards, we cannot see continued growth because our economy can't grow that. So we've got to make more use of the resources we've got and the resources of the people we've got uh, rather than investing more and more money. So some of the things that we're seeking to do in trying to tackle those arrangements, we're looking about how our reward arrangements and how they work not just about what the GPs do themselves, about how they provide the care, but also how about how, what they could do or should do with those patients in terms of what you, they go into hospital care and how you manage their care, getting into hospital care and getting them out quicker. And we want to try and make those reward arrangements um, reward the best practice rather than just the common practice. We've got to get greater integration of our care and our services, uh, trying to get them more joined up in how they deliver those arrangements and how they support the patients more effectively in how they manage their own health and social care arrangements. Uh, we've got to ensure those things are more convenient to patients. It's not just about what GPs uh, have always offered, it's about what's necessary for those patients to meet those needs. And that's one of the big access things we challenge. We've got to ensure that the care is not only joined up and coordinated in the planning and the delivery of those things, and that we can get the funding in the right place and by organizations working together. But we've got to make the information be shareable between those different clinicians. And it's not one person's job to hold that record, but to share that information among multiple clinicians who are caring for the patients in the primary or the hospital setting. One of the other solutions that we are increasingly using is patient choice and competition for patients to drive up quality and, and, and efficiency around delivering care. And I'll talk a bit more about that. And the other thing that we're seeking to do is much more transparency of data and performances of practices. We collect in the government an awful lot of information about practices, um, but we've sat on it. 
we've planned, we've performance managed, but we've never shared that information with the patients, with the public, and with the community. And we're starting to do that, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Access is important, and I'm not going to read the quote from Barbara Starfield that tried to explain very much, who's the guru on primary care, how important primary care is. But I think it, there's a really good evidence base that says if you can get access right, then actually it tends to get other things right too from those providers, and it's a good indication of good care if patients report they can get good access to those clinicians and those people caring for them. And where they're not getting that right, then there's a good indication also they're probably not getting the care they're delivering to the patient right as well. What's important, and we've all got to remember in this, is that patients want different things. And access for one patient means one thing, and it means something else for other patients. And we made that mistake in 2004 in some of the arrangements we have, where we offer a very, very good service for patients who are ill. We offer a really good service for patients who are at home because they're elderly or they've got young children. But if you work, we don't offer a good service. We offer from 9 till 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the evening, Monday to Friday. And if you're going to work early and you're coming home late, and if your employer isn't understanding about you needing to take time off to go and see the doctor because you're not feeling too well, or you've got a, a condition like diabetes that needs regular appointments and checkups to make sure it's confirmed, then you might lose income to go it. And there's a lot of evidence base to say that actually young males do not go and see their doctor because they tend to be in work and they tend to lose money if they don't go to work. Um, so we've got to offer different ways of accessing for patients, not just on an office hours basis, but ensuring that there's earlier opening, there's late evening opening, and there's weekend opening. And we have not got that right in England. We've also got to try and make more provision for walk-in services for patients that actually don't want to go and see the traditional GP that their mum and dad has been registered at and cared for in the last 20 years. They want to have something different. They want to walk in and be seen, and they don't mind who that clinician is. They probably won't see that doctor again. They'll go and see another doctor, and we've got to try and therefore get information about those patients to the right clinician uh, when they walk in and, and see those things. So access means different things for different people, and we've got to try and remember those things. They're not just about the hours that the practice is available, but it's about trying to make things more convenient, trying to make it more personal to those individuals, trying to allow those patients to be able to book ahead, trying also for them to use the electronic means to communicate with their practice. Do we always need to have a consultation face-to-face? -face? Could information happen on the, an email, um, iPhones? Can we share data? Can you report that data from home and send that data that evening through to the GP practice who can look at it a week later and say, ah, there's a problem here. We need to make an intervention. I'll phone the patient. We've got to think about how we join things up that people with long-term chronic conditions whose care um, can often be a bit disorderly. They want to see the same GP not the same practice, they want to say the same clinician who knows them, who understands their condition. So we've got to try and make things right for them as well, which isn't just for any doctor seeing them, but the right doctor seeing them. Um, our GPs, our doctors need to listen more and try to respond more. What we're seeing in England, because they're so busy, they're trying to treat one problem in one appointment. And if you've got two problems or three problems, you're told to come back tomorrow or the week after. That doesn't manage the care properly, and it doesn't manage being busy properly, because if you spend an extra 10 minutes with that patient, they may never come back again, or they may be able to have those things sorted out in one visit rather than three visits. So we're trying to work with our GPs to try and lengthen those consultation periods to provide things in one go rather than multiple times coming back. And then there are processy, transactional things that we call the, G, the patient into the practice to get a repeat prescription, to have a routine blood test. Why? Those things could be done at home, electronically, on the email system. So we're trying to invest much more and in changing the culture of our, our general practitioners to use that technology better.
So, um, improving access, why is it important? A number of reasons. Um, it's important because actually patients value it. It's actually the number one thing that they value about primary care services. And if you make the, the, the services less accessible, less meet their personal needs, then they won't go. They'll go somewhere else. And where they'll go is more expensive because they'll go to hospital for the same care. So it's really important that we try to change some of the customs and practices that operate within England and, the, and that thing. It's not a case anymore of the doctor knows best. Actually, the patient who has to live with that condition often knows better than the clinician. Um, we've got to actually make it better for patients to feel empowered and to manage their own care and those arrangements. And we've got to ensure that the premises, they provide those things, just like in Brazil was talking about yesterday, are modern, are convenient, are flexible, are clean, are places you want to go to be treated and not somewhere you want to keep away from. Much of those things are not just simply about investment. It's about changing the culture and the leadership of those people as well. Because if you want a different result, you just can't keep doing the same thing because it'll just deliver the same result. You have to change. And that's one of the key messages we're trying to get across to our GPs and how they do those things. We are lucky, though, because our patients generally report that actually the performance is very good. Most patients would recommend their practice to their family and to their friends. Uh, most patients say they can get a good, convenient appointment for what they want. And most patients are satisfied with the access of those things. But there are problems and those things we do need to, to sort out uh, and to get better at. Things we're doing to improve access. Um, first of all, practices have a duty, a responsibility to meet the reasonable needs of their patients. Not just about to provide the care between the nine and five, but actually to, to really have a duty to get out and find those patients. We're trying to put extra financial arrangements in place to improve those accessible things, to reward patients for achieving those things. Not to give upfront money, but reward money for achieving those things. And I'll talk a bit more about pay for performance tomorrow. We've got to change the attitude and culture of not only the, the clinicians, but the patients, and for the patients to demand that care and demand the services they want to have and not just get offered what they've always been delivered. Some of those things, we're doing it not by performance management, not by reward, but actually by making more information available to those communities, to the population, so they can make their own comparisons about what their own practice delivers to, compared to any other practice locally or wide, more widely in that respect. trying to rush along now. Um, some of the things that we're also trying to do is around increasing competition for those patients, um, to have greater rewards for those things. So I talked about general practice actually being based around a, a geographical area and patients living in that area being registered with that GP. I should have said that um, most patients, 90% uh, of patients live within one mile, 1 1.5 kilometers of at least two to three GP practices. They have some local choice. But one of the things we're trying to do is for patients in particular who travel, uh, who work away from home, who've got children where the school might be away from their home, to actually be registered with practices more locally to those things because it's more convenient for them to see at that time. And so we're doing some what we call choice pilots in three big cities in, in England, in Manchester, in London, and in Nottingham, and allowing any patient to be registered with any practice in those areas. And we're testing out whether those things work and what the consequences are. Because as I said earlier, any time you do something, it has an equal and opposite reaction somewhere else. And we need to understand that before we allow it all over the population. I'm not quite sure why this is uh, not moving on. Quality. Um, quality is really important. It's not just about access to services, it's about the quality of care that's provided. One of the big levers in that is about patient satisfactions. Recording what patients think, giving that information back to the practice so the practice can learn from it. Because at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do through audit or through telling people they've got to want to respond themselves. And we're trying to provide that information back at practice level with big surveys of patients reporting what their experience are. 
We're also using peer review where GPs review other GPs through the data that we provide that allows them those comparisons. Because any doctor who's at our heart a scientist wants to know why they're different. They want to know why they're so much better than their colleagues or so much worse than their colleagues. And actually providing that information on a named practice basis allows them to review where they stand and what their colleagues think of them and they respond to those things. We're also focusing on about how we can improve that data and that information to support those changes. I'm going to rush through the last few slides because I'm well out of time by now, if I can get these uh, things to move. We're providing a lot of comparative data on our GP practices. We've just published in December um, for all of our 8,300 practices over 200 different data items about the care that they provide, about the population they care for, so that you can compare those places. Uh, a colleague here who's um, going to be talking from the Information Center uh, will talk a bit more about this tomorrow, but it's basically around five headings. What is the characteristics of that population they're caring for, and the practice that's providing those things. What is the patient reported experiences in those practices? What is the quality of the care that's being delivered by uh, that practice to those individual patients across a number of disease areas? What is the investment that they've got in that practice? How are they using IT? How are they using their premises outside normal hours? Uh, and then finally, what is their impact about their referrals to other hospitals and to, to, to secondary care? how much of that is necessary and needed and how much are they treating urgent care appropriately in primary care. All of that data is available on a website and I'm not going to show you that and talk about that. It's broken down in those areas. There's 280 different items. You can compare three, four, five of those data items together by the characteristics of the practice and the population and you can make those comparisons. We're using that information to try to change people. For the public, that's too much information. There's, there's, not a, there's not something you can get a hold of there. So we have something in England called NHS Choices, and these are some screenshots from NHS Choices. And this allows a patient to go in, to name their practice, and to compare their practice against other practices in that area. It comes up as a map, put in your postcode, you can see your practice, you can see the other available practices in the area, you can click on them and you'll get some easy compared information that allows you to look and compare of those things that shows those practices and how they work and how they compare to their neighbours. So if their neighbour is better at offering diabetic care, you might want to go and register with them. If that practice doesn't have many young children but another neighbouring practice have, you might want to go and register with those as well. And that patient choice drives the funding flow I talked earlier because about 50 to 60% of the practice income is around that patient choice and where they register. Um, finally, some useful contact details. If I've rushed over it, if we don't have a chance to ask questions today or tomorrow, my email contact details, if you want to know more about NHS choices and the data available for patients, it's there. Uh, and also the uh, access to the NHS Information Centre and their comparator information and the tool that we've made available. Uh, the email directory is there as well. Thank you.